Uh, we're going to look at, here's our, here's our message map for today. We're going to see that Lot progressively slid out of God's will. Am I okay standing here? Good. We're going to see that he, pr he progressed through promotions in Sodom while he also lost his influence to live for God or to be a godly witness to them. We're going to see that Lot lived with the wicked while losing the opportunity. We're going to see that Lot languished about leaving Sodom. I mean, if two angels are telling me the place is going to blow up and they say, go here, I wouldn't beg them to go someplace else. But Lot does. And then we're going to see, well, what's the legacy? What, what, what lessons do we learn from Lot's legacy? Next slide. This next slide, the blue is not on your, in your notes. I uh, forgot to put this, this, this information in your notes. But we, we want to look at Lot's progression. How did he progressively slide into deep sin. He pitched his tent near Sodom. Then we see that he's living in Sodom, so he's actually captured in the war. Genesis 19.1, he's sitting in the gateway of the city when the angels approach. That's the place where the judges, he, ran for, he, he either ran for city council or was the mayor of Sodom. And that's why when the, 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 they call him, when the, when the men of Sodom, they say, you're going to be our judge? See, he progressed to be a judge in Sodom. He's sitting at the city gate. That's where you do all the official paperwork, where you, where you ratify and notarize uh, deals and documents. So, do you think the Sodomites would have elected someone to office if they said, I'm going to implement godly values in, in this community? No. no. Oh, he must have done something to get elected there, but it wasn't, it wasn't the right thing, apparently. All right, next slide. Now we're going to start your fill-ins. Um, the problem with Sodom, Genesis 13, 13, is that the men of Sodom were sinning wickedly against whom? The Lord. Well, my sin is not hurting anybody. Sin is hurting you first. It's putting you on the bad side of the judge of the universe. In the King James, it says, but the men of Sodom were wicked. That means they were wicked, bad, evil, miserable, severely troubled, and unpleasant sinners. Before the Lord. That means they kind of know what's right. It's like, it's like Nimrod. He was, a, he was a mighty warrior before the Lord. That means in God's face. I know what's right, but I'm doing it my way. And the Lord said in Genesis 18, 20, that because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave. Can you imagine you're a passerby? You're tired. And you go to a rooming house in Sodom. And the men of Sodom break the door down and drag you out to the city streets to know you biblically in the public square. That's the kind of sin they were. You know why? Because homosexuality messes up your mind. You give yourself over to sin like that and it'll, it messes with every part of your beam, every part of your frame of reference. It, it changes the way you think. Sin is a personal affront to God. He takes it personally. That's why the Bible says, whosoever believes in John 3.16. He's taken your sin personally. He knows you by name. He's got the hairs of your head that numbered. You, you mess with... You, you. There is something about homosexuality that so fundamentally undermines God's plan for humankind in that he made them male and female that when you give yourself over to this kind of wickedness, you don't pass go. You, you don't collect $200. God comes down and blows the place up himself. Billy Graham has warned us that if God, God who, who, who is not going to apologize, if he, if he doesn't judge the major cities of America, Europe, and now the world for this sin, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. I don't think God's an apologizing God. You give your Romans 128 talks about having a reprobate mind. That means that you have a mind that completely and utterly rejects what God wants it to do. You don't want God to turn you over to a reprobate mind. That's why when we sin, we need to say, Lord, please do not take your hand off me. I need to feel this conviction. Some people will try to use Ezekiel 16, 49 to say that Sodom's sin was that it did not take care of the poor because it, that is in the verse mentioning, mentioning Sodom there. But you've got to read verse 50. You've got to read Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. See, 
the homosexuals will not quote Ezekiel to you. They'll just say, well, Sodom's sin was that they didn't take care of poor people. But verse 50 says, the, the sin is called an abomination. And, what, and uh, what their calloused hearts did, their hearts became so callous to the point that they committed this sin of pride in wanton, selfish ease that abused every poor traveler who happened to have the misfortune of thinking you could find a night of rest in Sodom. And the Bible says in verse 49, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. That doesn't mean giving food to the poor and needy. It means when some poor traveler passed by your community, you gathered the men of the city to rape them. They were haughty and did an abomination before me. So I removed them when I saw it. The sin of the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah was so great that God came down and he blew the place up himself. So, what does 1 Corinthians tell us to do with sexual sin? It says to flee. Because it's, it's so challenging to deal with. You just get in the heat of the moment. So the Bible says when you feel that heat, just run. Isn't that what Joseph did when Potiphar's wife tried to entrap him? You know, we always say, well, all sin is the same. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible literally teaches that sexual sin is worse than other sins. That's why it messes with your mind so much. It'll change your frame of reference. It'll change your view of right and wrong. Every other sin is outside the body. That, you know, it says body, it's talking about the whole human nature. Other sins profane only the outer courts of the temple that is our bodies, wherein the Holy Spirit is supposed to dwell. But other sins, they enter in and they actually begin. It's like idol worship. We, 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 we become like what we worship. Homosexuals are worshiping sex. They're willing to define their lives as, as, as sex. You're not a hero because you choose to have sex. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown say this. The fornicator alienates the body, which is the Lord's, and makes it one with the harlot or the person with whom you are sinning. And so you sin against your own body. That, that is, you sin against the very nature of how God made us to be. The pulpit commentary says this. Other sins may be with and by means of the body may injure the body, but none are so directly against the sanctity of the whole soul as fornication. You're sinning against not only your own body, you're actually sinning against your soul. Your soul can be turned over to be a reprobate. I could go on with Matthew Henry, Wesley, but we're not going to. The word flee means to escape. There's something about sex sin that, that should inspire such a, 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 a sense of threat to us that our, we should get a spiritual impulse to run. Next slide. Why did God save Lot? Was it because he was such a stellar guy? Or was God remembering his promise to Abram, to Abraham? Yeah. The Bible says God remembered Abraham. Do you know some of the sinners that we work with are going to get rescued from God by God because God's remembering you. God's remembering your prayer. God's remembering the burden of your heart for those sinners. God's remembering the burden of my heart for those sinners. And despite themselves, he will come and he will perform an amazing rescue. We should be encouraged by this to pray for our loved ones. God certainly, certainly will answer prayer. And we see that Lot the, we're going to see how the Bible says Lot was a righteous man. He's probably saved eternally 
but his life seems to have little positive impact. Like I said, many Christians are going to go to heaven with their diapers on, sucking their thumbs, be babes. Let's move on. What about Lot's daughters? We see that Lot's daughters were damaged by Sodom, by living in Sodom. They had been raised as pagans in an ungodly environment. They were actually pledged to marry Sodomites, unequally yoked. The boys were so deadened to spiritual things that they laughed at the day of their visitation. They laughed as the destruction, as the clouds of destruction, the forces of destruction were gathering above them. They neither saw the weather pattern and discerned it. They neither saw that the atmosphere was changing. They, as, as, as the, the, the destruction of the Lord was visibly gathering about them, I can imagine there was thunder. This was a different type of thunder. There was lightning, but there was something fiercer about it, something more ominous. They were so spiritually dead. They were so involved in their sin. And the Bible says that all the men of the city came pounding on Lot's doors, including those boys to whom he had pledged his daughters. They completely missed their day of, of visitation. This should be a warning to the world. I mean, God could turn the switch off and the switch in a moment's notice. This is why I'm so fervent about these things. We need to repent. The church should not be the tail being wagged by the government dog that is promoting sin. We need to warn our world. Our world needs to repent. You have two options. Repent or die. There's... God says, choose this day whom you will serve. I offer you life or death. There's no half life. And there's no half death. All right, let's talk about Mrs. Lot. Well, Lot's wife whiffs out. I got a couple more on her that also. Which of the following do you think is why she looked back? Her main problem is she failed to look ahead. How many Christians do we know they get saved, but they never go to church? They get saved, but they never uh, study their Bibles. They never look forward. They never look ahead to what God has for them. It's like they're marking time. Whew, I'm saved. They don't understand that the world is about to overcome them. I had a guy say to me when I was in the military, we were all praying. It was like 44 of us came to Christ in a, in, a, in a period of about four to six months. And uh, the, these, these two churches just blew up with all of us young people. And um, a guy said to me one day, he said, Earl, I've noticed with the people that we're witnessing to, the ones that don't receive Christ, and, and we did, I, did I, I could see this in my own life. The people would say, well, I'm bad, but I'll never do, I'll never do whatever. I'll never do A, B, or C, X, Y, or Z. And within a year, a short period of time, they were doing those things. You can see people's lives being turned over to reprobation. I did it in my life. In junior high school, I said, well, I may do this, but I'll never do that. And senior high, I did that. In senior high, I said, I may do this, but I'll never do that. When I got away from home, I did that. Lot, Lot's wife looked back. She whiffed out. Was it because she was longing for the life she was leaving? It is easier to choose the misery that you know over the Lord's will of which we are unsure. And we have a great propensity to tolerate misery. We try to drink a little to overcome it. We try to party though. But here's the real challenge. Do you think she actually ever accepted Abraham's God? I wonder if Lot even told them about how he got to where, how he'd, how he'd get there anyway. I wonder if he even told them the story. We don't know.
We're going to talk about the heart at the end of this. Look at Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you, do, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from... Christians have to do two things. You have to declare with your mouth and believe with your heart. If you haven't declared it to anybody with your mouth, it may not be in your heart. The reason we don't express what's in our heart is because we don't want to take the heat that may come with that. I went to a coffee shop this week and a guy called over to me and I went to the bathroom and then I came back. He goes, hey, man, let me take a picture of you drinking your coffee. And he showed me the picture. He had written black Jesus on the, on the other side of my cup. <laughs> So I said to him, don't be, don't be dissing Jesus. He's the only means of salvation. Someone else said, well, is Jesus black? I said, no, he's a Middle Eastern Jew. <laughs> but his hair is like lambs, well, it tells us in, uh, in Isaiah. I said, we need to stop making Jesus after our image. Jesus is Jesus. He loves us all, yes. We are all made in his image. Right? We're trying to reflect him. Stop trying to put Jesus in your, in your box, right? Jesus is not a black guy. Jesus is not an Irish guy. Jesus is not a woman. Although he did say, I wanted to gather at Jerusalem like a hen gathers, gathers chicks, right? If you read the Bible as a woman, if you read a feminist, if you read the Bible as a black guy, if you read the Bible as an Irish guy, if you read the Bible as anything other than a sinner, you're going to miss what God wants you to see in his Bible, you got to read the Bible as a sinner guy or a sinner gal. You know, the writers say that, amen, a sinner saved by grace. And if you see that in every verse of scripture, you probably won't go wrong in your Bible interpretation. You know, the, 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 uh, the Jewish writers say that, uh, that Mrs. Lot's name was Adith, A-D-I-T-H, or I-R-I-T-H. And uh, the, the Josephus and other people, uh, they have her name in, in their writings. Anyway, let's look at Lot's wife. She whiffs out, but look what she sinks into. Does she become a saint? No, she doesn't sink into sainthood. She sinks into salthood. <laughs> She's changed to a pillar of her salt, which is, it's, you know what salt is? Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You're supposed to be a cleansing and a preserving agent. They failed to do that. Hmm? Good honey. Yeah. Trap them by the salt lick. Mm -hmm. Do you know that the scholars, they give us a bunch of interesting theories about how this happened. Now, they're saying it didn't happen instantaneously. They're saying, like Elliot says, that she, was, she, she lingered back and was overcome by sulfurous vapors. And her body subsequently encrusted with salt. Because the, the territory was full of that element. More probably, it could have been an earthquake when the, when, when, when the destruction hit the ground and it blew up. The earthquake might have caused her to fall because she lingered back. And then she was overcome by the strata that came over her body. Josephus, Calvin, Rossmuller, Kalish, and Wordsworth all say she was killed by fiery sulfurous vapor with which the atmosphere was impregnated and afterwards she became encrusted with salt. I could go on and on. There's a bunch of them. It's kind of interesting to read. Gill's even has something on this. Gill, who's not a very deep thinker in my opinion, but he even got something on Lot's wife. Anyway, what, 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 what is the symbol God's trying to tell us here? Uh, salt is a symbol of perpetuity. In the Old Testament, you ratified permanent covenants with salt. They were called covenants of salt. Something was going to last forever. Make your commitment. The Bible says, swear to your own hurt and change not. Let God discipline us. Hebrews 12. We are all children to be disciplined. Swear allegiance to the Lord. And when it hurts, change not. And you will live a glorious life with Christ in perpetuity. Anyway, let's move on. So, Lot languished about leaving Sodom, and Sodom lingered in Lot and his family. 
How many people did the angels want to rescue? They wanted to rescue Lot, his wife, two daughters, and two boys. He wanted to, six people, right? Let's do it again. Lot and his wife, two daughters, two boys. So six, right? How many got out? Lot and his two daughters. That's a tragedy. The Bible says that God is willing that none should perish, but all should have everlasting life. I hope more than half of us make it out alive. Now, the boys laughed. We're going to see in a few, a few chapters that Sarah laughs. Sarah gets saved and she gets promised despite her laughter. But why did the boys perish from theirs? What's the difference? What's the contrast? You see, Sarah had already made steps of faith. Sarah was already in a position of, of ultimate vulnerability. She's a woman that's been proclaimed as barren. The doctors have pronounced her barren. She can't have children. And she's gone off on, 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 a, on a tremendous faith journey following a God who says, I'm going, to, I'm going to make you and your husband into a great nation. 24 years later or so, well, 23 years later, she laughs. It, Lot's would-be son-in-laws never took any step of faith. They just laughed. Next one. Lot lived with the wicked while losing opportunity to influence them for God. I was a high school English teacher, and the teachers sometimes, when I would walk into the English department, they would stop talking. I purposed in my heart, I will never be persecuted like this again as a Christian. I went to my next job, and I purposed, I'm not going to tell anybody I'm a Christian. I'm not going through this again. It took about three weeks. I couldn't stand it. The people around me were going to hell. I started talking about Christ. I started walking into offices and people would shut up as I walked in. And I realized, you know what? I'm a Christian. There's something in my heart that is going to cause me to be hurt at times by the world. But I can't ignore or deny what's in my heart. And now, I'm so dysfunctional I'm comfortable with that hurt. I am not intimidated by that hurt. I'm not ashamed of that hurt. I'm not even embarrassed by it. That's what kind of fool I am. No, just kidding. I'm God's fool. Whose fool are you? God has caused the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. I love that Psalm 37, 1 through 9 that we read, where, where it's an imprecatory prayer. God, confound the wicked plans of the enemy who are going to stand against us. The Bible says that composure before the king is a mighty weapon. Don't ever let him see you sweat. Don't ever apologize for being a Christian. Once a man said to me at work one day, oh gosh, I came... These, these uh, Jehovah Witnesses knocked on my door, and he goes, oh my gosh, what do you think about those crazy people? And I prayed very quickly, and the Holy Spirit said, I said to him, I'm ashamed of myself. I've never knocked on your door. I said, I believe that this room right now is burning with the fires of hell, and I won't even tell you, because I'm afraid that you'll reject me. I said, I'm so convinced that, this, that you are on your way to hell that I should be grabbing you by your collar and I should be shaking you and saying, you have to get right with Jesus. I said, I'm ashamed of myself that I've never knocked on your door. He received Christ a few days later. I'm learning. Don't let them denigrate other religions or at least what they think is the Christian religion in front of you. There's some truth in all of them. We don't want them going in those directions. But everything is an opportunity for Jesus Christ to shine and the truth of the Bible to shine. 
They're going to try to deflect the discussion. What about those other religions? You have to deal with Jesus, not those other religions. So, look at what 2 Peter 7 through 8 says about Lot. He was a righteous man. His soul was tormented. He was distressed by living in Sodom. Their lawless deeds were, were, were causing him to lay awake at bed at night, probably because he heard the screams of the poor passerbys that they were persecuting. The word distress means that he was exhausted and worn. The word righteous means that he has right standing in Christ, not a righteousness of his own. Distressed, he was exhausted, worn out, overpressed, and overpowered by what he was living in. Don't stay there and wait till it gets that, to that point. Because of the lives of, look at the filthy lives of lawless men who are noted for their lewdness and their outrageously, shockingly, indecent public conduct that included wanton, un deliberate, and unprovoked violence against strangers. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented, tortured, buffeted by the shock of the waves of sin in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. And while he was a judge, apparently did nothing about it. Why did Lot do this? Was it because of A, the Sodomite's sinful behavior was well known, didn't deter him because, you know, come on. We're, 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 we only got to deal with spiritual things. We don't really have to worry about the world, right? Doesn't God tell us to be in but not of? Well, it seems like he was in, and John said this during our prayer time, that Lot didn't lead, he didn't follow, and what's the third one? He didn't get out of the way. And he didn't get out of the way. Because he got captured with Sodom. Did Lot believe in separation of church and state? So that, come on, man, that means, they got a law. The law says that you're here. We can rape you. You may not know the law, but that's not my, that's not my fault. Your ignorance is no excuse before the law. I mean, what the government does, the government does. We're the church. Don't worry about that. Just come to church. Don't worry about common core. Don't worry about aborting babies. Don't worry about them telling your children that they need to be homosexuals. Just come to church. It's going to be fine. Say it again. Or different, gender. or different genders. Eleven genders that can fluctuate throughout the day. God said I made them male and female. There's, no, there's a reason why our children go to college and come back little atheists. Because so much of what college teaches can only be true if the Bible is not. Somebody has stolen the children of this country. Walk with me. We're going to take some back. Isn't it that God, did Lot believe that witnessing is best done by being a shining Christian example? I'm going to live so righteously that people are just going to want to know Jesus. What's the problem with that? What does Romans 3.23 say? All have sinned and fallen short. You are a poor Bible, let me tell you. <laughs> You need to let people know that, yeah, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And the operative word there is saved by grace. You can keep your eyes on me as a sinner. You're going to be disappointed. I'm going to try not to disappoint you, but I'm a fallible. We should have heard John in prayer this morning. He was all laughing, weak, frail. <laughs> Come to church. We offer you hope, growth, and opportunity. <laughs> A contemporary relevant message <laughs> that ignores what's going on around us. It's all about my relationship with God. It's all about my relationship with my family. My relationship with my family and God is right. If I come to church and my relationship with my church is right, then everything's right. Yeah. I like her, so I'm not going to repeat that one. <laughs> 
We have churches. They say well, Albany, New York is the most unchurched area. And we have people coming into this area to start churches. I don't want them here. We don't need another church lulling the public to sleep. Teaching them everything, teaching them good stuff that's going to make you be prosperous, maybe. If the government doesn't take it all from you, they never talk about the government stealing from you. So just earn more so that when they take more, you notice it less. All right, let's wrap this up. Do you know that Satan, is there one more slide? Is there one after this? Okay, let's go back. You're right. Okay. Do you know that Satan is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, what happens, what does what do you call it when you eat your own, when you eat people? What do they call it when you're, cannibal. Satan is a cannibal. He wanted to cannibalize Lot. Lot had, Lot was the judge. Lot, Lot was kind of, he wasn't maybe leading the parade, but he certainly wasn't stopping the parade. Maybe he was cutting the ribbon for the parade. And so they knock on Lot's door, and when Lot tries to stop him, they said, you know what, we're going to do worse to you than we do to them. Satan is a cannibal. Don't participate with him. He's going to consume you. He damaged his daughters by having them raised in that sinful environment. That's why they had, that's why they had children with their father. They didn't know any better. They probably also looked around and said, oh, my gosh, we're the last people on earth. What's going to happen? If you think you're the last person on earth, don't sin. When the worst happens, go on autopilot and keep the Ten Commandments. Don't panic and sin. Lot's legacy is they become the Moabites and the Amorites, the, the arch enemies of God's plan for Israel. Now let's read this. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. We saw that with the Nephilim. That's in Jude. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, whom he uh, brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. But here's the point today. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented in his righteous soul over their lawless deeds, and he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. Sexual sin is way worse than other sin. Don't get me wrong. The sins, any sin is going to send you to hell. But don't go around and let people tell us now, well, you know, all sins are the same. The Bible teaches, no, they are not. All right, let's move on. How did Lot lose his way? He walked by sight. He saw how beautiful the world looked. He was heading for the bright lights of Sodom. And the place must have been gorgeous. That's why people were, going, were stopping there. Boy, but, you know, beautiful on the outside. A horror story on the inside. There's three types of hearts in the Bible. There's probably five. But I got it three because it wasn't going to fit on my page, on your bulletin. I got some of them hyphenated. There's burning pure hearts. In, in Luke, on the road to Emmaus, the two disciples said, wasn't our hearts burning when Jesus was speaking to us? Why'd they burn? Because their hearts were pure. 1 Timothy 1.5. The goal is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Keep sinning sexually, you will destroy your conscience. I used to have a bumper sticker that said, let your conscience, and it had a, a X'd out conscience, and it said, Bible be your guide. Don't go by your fallen, wicked conscience. You'll justify anything, you self-preserving sinner, you. <laughs> uh, there's lukewarm, indecisive hearts. Lot didn't lead, Lot didn't follow, and Lot didn't get out of the way. Never teach this again, that's going to be in there. <laughs> They're in the, in what, is, what does God say about them in, in Revelation 3.16? I'm going to spew you out of man. That I mean, that's, whew. 
That, the words are really awful in, in the Greek and Hebrew, but you, you look at the different translations. I will spit you out of my mouth. I will vomit you. It's like a gag reflux. You ain't getting into heaven. I don't know. Maybe you will. All right. Then there's cold, calloused hearts. That word also means, if you look at different translations, unfeeling and unbelieving hearts. Psalm 119.70 and Ephesians 3.12 says this. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Obedience means faith. If I have faith, I'm a, I'm a, I have obedience. If I, if I have faith and I have no works, then that's kind of a dead thing. Talk is cheap. You got to live it. But tell, trust me with this. Even if you can't live it, please talk it. Because two things, one of two things will happen. The sinners will get on your case as they used to get on mine, and then you'll get, you'll, get, you'll get better with God. You'll get more right with God. They'll call you to account. Or, and or, they'll also hear the truth. Truth sets you free. Anything else is going to entrap us. Now look at what the Bible says about all these heart things. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your uh, soul, and with all your mind. Mark twelve thirty and Luke ten twenty seven. add the word strength to that, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you loved your neighbor, would you let your neighbor stay in, in Sodom without warning your neighbor? Is that love? Do you love love or do you love God? We love love. I'm so loving, I'm not going to tell them anything that God says. I don't want them to be offended at me because I love them so much. Acts 2.26, it ties our hearts and our tongues together. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Luke 6.45, a good man brings forth good things out of the good stored up. A good, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. The goodness of our hearts, however, requires God to work and circumcise our hearts. I'm going to end with this, Romans 2.29. No person is a Jew who is one inwardly. Circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. The law is not going to circumcise our hearts, but that's a work that God does in us.